Mark chapter 13 is an apocalyptic prophecy. It starts with Jesus predicting the destruction of the temple, persecution of Jesus' followers, and it contains two important verses for dating. Now, as Jesus was going out of the temple courts, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look at these tremendous stone buildings. Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left on another. All will be torn down. The temple was destroyed by Titus and his armies in 70 AD, and Josephus gives an account of the destruction. He tells us that the temple was destroyed by fire. In a later section in War of the Jews, he refers to the ashes of the temple. In other places, he talks about Jerusalem being destroyed and torn down, but his destruction of the temple is somewhat different from that predicted by Jesus here in Mark. Josephus does not describe a degree of destruction where one stone is not left on another. The comparable prediction in Matthew's Gospel is much closer to Josephus' version, and this leads scholars to pretty much universally believe that Matthew was written after the temple's destruction, but because of this difference with Mark, and a later verse we'll come to shortly, the consensus on Mark is not so universal, with some scholars believing that it postdates the destruction and some believing that it predates it, but by a short enough time that the conflict with Rome was already underway and the ultimate destruction could be predicted fairly easily. The section from verse 3 to the end of the chapter is known as the Olivet Discourse because Mark tells us Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives when he delivered these teachings. The discourse contains what is known as the Little Apocalypse, which refers to verses 5 to 8, 14 to 20 and 24 to 27. It is hypothesised that this Little Apocalypse in particular was not written originally by Mark, but he got it from another source. Verse 3. So while he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to take place? Jesus began to say to them, Watch out that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and he will mislead many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. These things must happen, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise up in arms against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines. These are but the beginnings of birth pains. You must watch out for yourselves. You will be handed over to councils and beaten in the synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings because of me, as a witness to them. First the gospel must be preached to all nations. When they arrest you and hand you over for trial, do not worry about what to speak, but say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking but the Holy Spirit. Brother will hand over brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Saved, in verse 13, probably means physical life will be preserved rather than spiritual salvation. Otherwise, it would give the wrong impression. Verse 10 is of some interest because this verse, and the parallel verse in Matthew, lie behind much Christian missionary activity over the centuries based on the belief that preaching the gospel internationally would hasten the second coming of Jesus. Verse 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one on the roof must not come down or go inside to take anything out of his house. The one in the field must not return back to get his cloak. Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing their babies in those days. Pray that it may not be in winter, for in those days there will be suffering unlike anything that has happened from the beginning of creation that God created until now, or ever will happen. And if the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would be saved. But because of the elect whom he chose, he has cut them short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe him. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the elect. Be careful, I have told you everything ahead of time. The meaning of the abomination of desolation isn't clear, and there are numerous theories about it. It may be a reference to Daniel 9 verse 27. This is a highly cryptic prophetic chapter that I've discussed in my video on the 70 year argument and if Mark was referring to that verse then it doesn't get us very much further with what he actually meant. 
Daniel's version may have been an after-the-event prophecy referring to Antiochus Epiphanes IV, who turned the Jewish temple into a sanctuary for the Olympian god Zeus in 168 BC and sacrificed pigs on the altar. There have been a number of theories about what Mark meant, such as Caligula's attempt to put a statue of himself in the temple, or the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus, or some other event in the ancient world, or some as yet unfulfilled future event. Also, accusing others of what you are yourself guilty of is a fairly common theme in the New Testament, in this case Jesus claiming to be the Messiah, while warning against false messiahs. Then verse 24, But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man arriving in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send angels and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Learn this parable from the fig tree. Whenever its branches become tender and put out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also you, when you see these things happening, know that he is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Here, verse 30, is the other verse important for dating. Jesus is predicting that the coming of the Son of Man will occur before the current generation, that is his audience, dies. And that gives the prophecy a fairly specific time frame and expiry date. As Mark has located Jesus' ministry around the year 30, that would put the expiry date for this well within the first century. And even at 70 AD it would be getting rather strained as the generation in question would have largely passed away by then. Resolving the tensions between this prophecy and the one about the destruction of Jerusalem is the reason why Mark is generally dated within a few years either side of 70 AD. Verse 32. But as for the day or the hour, no one knows it, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son except the Father. Watch out, stay alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. He left his house and put his slaves in charge, assigning to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to stay alert. Stay alert then, because you do not know when the owner of the house will return whether during evening, at midnight, when the rooster crows, or at dawn. Or else he might find you asleep when he returns suddenly. What I say to you, I say to everyone, stay alert. Chapter 13 is really the culmination of Jesus' ministry. He has very little to say after this. It looks forward primarily not to his death or resurrection, but to his second coming. Mark does not have any post-resurrection appearances, so it could be that Mark considered the second coming and the first appearance on earth post-death to be the same thing. However, against that is that in this passage he refers to the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, whereas the young man sitting in his tomb in chapter 16 tells the women that he's going to show up in Galilee. 